Good morning, church. Good morning. Today I'm going to speak to you on smart moves for tired marriages. Is your marriage tired? You know, it slips up on us. I want you to meet my friends um, Rick and Debbie. Uh, when they were newly married, they both had full-time careers. They worked 40 hours a week plus some. And they uh, would come home at night, but they were young. No children. So they had plenty of time yet for talk and late night walks. And sometimes they would lie in bed and hold each other and continue talking. They were active in church on the weekends, and they had friends, and they'd go out with their friends. Had so much fun together. But then what happened? They had children. And life began to change once they had children. There, were, there, there was no time for those late night talks anymore. They were too exhausted once they hit the bed. And on weekends, they were so exhausted, they couldn't even make it to church. And the friends they used to have, well, they couldn't even keep up with them anymore. And uh, romance, next to no time for romance anymore. Uh, and there was an ever-widening gap between the two of them. Lonely husband, lonely wife. This is a desperate time for a marriage. Now, uh, Rick and Debbie, when they were around other people, they acted normal. Nobody else knew that inside they were feeling empty, that there was this big hole. Uh, Debbie longed for their marriage to be like it used to be. She longed to have him take her in his arm, her arms. And she, she, she remembers he used to be a fabulous kisser. It's been a long time since she felt any of those fabulous kisses anymore. And um, uh, Rick was confused and helpless. What do men do when their marriages aren't fulfilled? They work more, or they express it through anger. So this is what they were doing. Now notice that Rick and Debbie were not considering divorce. No, that had never come up. It was not on the agenda. They just weren't happy anymore. Their marriage was empty and they were both lonely. They both knew that something was wrong. They just didn't know what to do about it. And this happens in many marriages today. Their marriage was stressed and they were bored with each other and they were approaching what is called marital burnout. Now what is marital burnout? It is a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion in marriage. That's what it is. Now, couples marry because they expect marriage to bring them the kind of happiness and fulfillment that they have wanted all of their lives. But after a few years, they realize this isn't happening for us. Now, you've got to understand that marital burnout does not happen overnight. It creeps up on you slowly when you realize your partner isn't as exciting as he or she used to be. Many marriages will struggle on for a few years. Then they begin to take one another for granted. Life settles into a dull routine. There is little or no time for fun and romance anymore. Why? Because no one's tending the fires. There is no one making romance happen in the relationship. But it's at this point that something has to be done or things will go from bad to worse. You know, the pressures of keeping a man and a woman in a marital state together for a lifetime, this is tremendous pressure. And I want couples to stop right here and take inventory right now of what's going on in their marriages. Um, I want to stop couples heading to the divorce court. Now, how can we keep our marriages from burning out over the years? Well, soon after we get married, we stop sharing openly. It's not like we took a vow uh, when we were married at the marriage seminary for silence, no. But we begin to shut down. We do not share as openly as we once did. Why? Well, let's look at John. John's quite a joker. He loves to poke fun at his wife, Joan. Oh, sorry we're late. Uh, Joan tried to make herself look beautiful. She failed again. 
Now Joan has told him that she doesn't like this kind of joking, but he goes right ahead and does it anyway. He says, oh, you know I love you. That's just part of my personality. I say this stuff, but down, down deep, you know I love you. All right, now who's at fault? He's putting the blame on her for what he is doing. Um, at year after year, this type of behavior goes on. Joan takes more and more of this kind of insensitive uh, joking and sarcasm, and she finally begins to shut down. Let's look at another couple. Jim comes home from work. Hi, honey, I'm home. No answer. Uh, he goes to her and looks. Uh, something wrong? No. Now that no means yes, but men aren't good at playing this game. And um, so he lets it go. A smart man would not let it go. He would try to find out what's at the bottom of why she's upset, why she's not talking. He has probably hurt her in some way, and he needs, needs to make things right now before they get any worse. You know, this business of offending one another happens so often at home. Uh, you know what scripture says on this? Scripture says, I said I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. That's King James. But let's look now at what uh, the NIV says. I will put a muzzle on my mouth. Do you know anybody that needs a muzzle on their mouth? Amen. Uh, uh, there are a few people I've met. Uh, and then the Living Bible says, I'm going to quit complaining, I'll keep quiet. Good advice. Good advice. So, do we keep still? Rarely, unless we aren't speaking. And even then, we can use silence as a weapon. Uh, we use it through our body language. Uh, day after day, we go on hurting one another, sometimes deliberately, sometimes on purpose. And pretty soon, the walls begin to go up. Day by day, husband and wife will become closed to each other. Now, what can we do about this? All right, there are certain steps that you can take to get through this hurt. And first of all, you need to seek forgiveness when necessary. Because Proverbs 15.1 tells us that harsh words stir up anger, but a soft answer turns away wrath. And if we're going to repair any damage or hurt done to a spouse, we are going to have to do it with gentleness, kindness, and a soft, gentle spirit. Now, I was working with one couple. The uh, wife had been hurt terribly over the years. Her husband had done uh, a series of things that had wounded her to the very core. She was so low, we practically had to pick her up off the floor. And uh, she was seated there, and I asked her to express, tell him in nutshell form, what it was that, um, that uh, he had done to her over the years. And he didn't seem to know what to do once he heard this. So I um, told him to go. He needed a little coaching here. So I told him to go and sit close by her. So he mechanically did that. Now I said, pick up her hand. He mechanically picked up her hand. I said, look into her eyes. So he mechanically looks into her eyes. Now I said, tell her you are sorry. So he said he was sorry for hurting her and a few more words like that. And um, then after his little speech, she says, you don't really mean it. You're just doing what Nancy told you to do. Now at this point, she did absolutely everything wrong. And he became very angry and defensive. See, every time I say something to her, this is what she does. She lashes back at me, yada, yada, yada. Now, when you seek forgiveness from somebody, especially if they have been desperately hurt, you may have to take a little flack. That's, that's what comes with the hurting somebody. Um, if you want to restore the relationship, you are going to have to take a step back and allow forgiveness to take place. You can't be defensive during the process if you want to restore the relationship. Now, I did an interesting thing. 
I had him move away from her, and I went and sat next to her. I looked deeply into her eyes. I took her hand. I began stroking her hand. I began telling her that I understood what it must be like to feel that kind of hurt and that kind of pain. And it was interesting to see the tears well up in her eyes. And then she began to relax as she felt that it was genuine coming from me. Um, when you are seeking forgiveness, you cannot be defensive. And another step when you are seeking forgiveness is you have to admit you were wrong. This is a hard step to take. Honey, I handled this all wrong. I admit it. I, I wouldn't talk about it when you wanted to. I got angry and I said things I shouldn't have. Did you hear all those eyes in there? This person is admitting without blaming the other person, not being defensive. I did what was wrong. Okay. And then next come the words, I'm sorry. When saying the words, you better mean them because somebody can look at you, watch you, and they know whether you mean it or not. They will be able to tell by your eye contact and by your body language whether they read you like a book, especially when this is a spouse. Does he mean what he's saying? And they will be evaluate if you really mean it. So you better look like it and sound like it and choose your words carefully. Also, when you are seeking forgiveness, you must state what it is you are sorry for. Yes, you say the words, I'm sorry, but saying I'm sorry isn't good enough. A lot of people say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They're the sorriest people you ever saw. But you don't have the faintest idea of what it is they are sorry for. You must state the behavior you were sorry for. I'm sorry for blowing up at you the way I did. And I'm sorry for the awful things that I said to you when I was angry. Whatever the offense, state what you are sorry for and you name the offense. Now there are three steps to um, asking for forgiveness. So number one is to state that you, um, that what you are sorry for. Number two is to state what you are sorry for. And number one is to uh, state what the offense was. Now you can, um, you can judge right away if that person uh, has accepted your uh, forgiveness because if that person moves away from you they're not through with this yet so you can evaluate by touch if the person will give you a hug or take your hand do anything like that you know the process is over but the reestablishing of touch uh, will tell it all and um, now let's look at the other side your partner has offended you and he has not asked for forgiveness. How should you respond to a person like this? Through silence, by holding a grudge, getting resentful. All of these are biblical answers, aren't they? Um, a simple but profound truth has been taught to us through a prayer that we repeat many times each year. Uh, this prayer is found we call it the Lord's Prayer. Uh, let's repeat this prayer together, shall we? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our what? Debts. Uh, financial debts? As we forgive what? Our debtors. We'll talk in a minute. We'll talk about what scripture is talking about here. Let's go on. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, debts and debtors, a dictionary definition says, an offense requiring restoration. Many people repeat the Lord's Prayer and do not really understand that we're talking about offenses here. That's what we're talking about. 
So what this prayer does is invite us to forgive those who have offended us. And it doesn't matter whether this person has asked for forgiveness or not. We have, must have the spirit in us to forgive them. And if we refuse to forgive them, ooh, do you want to hear what comes next? If we refuse to forgive them, what's the answer? God can't forgive us of our offenses. That's a scary thought. And some people live with resentments for years and years. Is there just cause sometimes? There's very just cause. Many times this has happened in families where there's been abuse. Very difficult things, but we've got to let it go as adults. Um, I had a privilege uh, a few years of going, of going to Harlem, um, Holland, where Corey Ten Boone, do you all know the story of Corey Ten Boone, who harbored uh, in her family, they saved many Jews during the war, and she's known for speaking on this subject and writing books on this subject. And uh, I took a tour through the house. I actually crawled through the little crawl space there that you see actually that they've cut that hole in the wall because where the Jews were hidden was um, where the door is open there and there is um, there are things here on the bottom that shelf uh, is re removable the back wall there that was removable and then uh, the Jews would crawl through there and hide in a crawl space and then they would put things back on the shelf and the Nazis never found that out for years but um, the late Corey Ten Boone, I'm going to share this story with you because it fits so well here. The late Corey Ten Boone was known for helping Jews escape German torture camps during World War II. By the way, I have been to five death camps. Do you know anybody else that's been to five concentration camps? It, um, you know, when I was first invited to go to Poland, I thought, who wants to go to Poland? What's in Poland? And I found Poland to be one of the most fascinating countries and it played a key part during the war, especially for Jews. And um, so I've been to a number of death camps there and also Dachau in uh, Germany. But uh, one time after she had been released from a concentration camp herself, she was speaking at a church in Germany. After she sp finished speaking, the crowd began to file out of the church. But one man made his way toward the front to speak with her. When she saw him, she froze and was filled with horror. She recognized him as a guard at the concentration camp where she and her sister Betsy had been interned. He was one of the most cruel men there and had actually been instrumental in causing the death of her sister Betsy. She was almost nauseated by the sight of him. Her spirit had been closed to him years before. Now he stood before her and held out his hand and said, Corey Ten Boon, I have become a Christian, and I know God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did. But I've come to ask you if you would forgive me. Corey said her arms were frozen to her sides. She absolutely couldn't move. She said it was the most difficult thing she ever did. But finally she lifted her arm and accepted his hand and told him she forgave him. At that moment she said it was like all the venom and the hatred she had stored up inside of her because of the cruelty she had suffered just flowed out of her and God's love flowed out of me and into him, she said. I really did release him from what he had done to me and for my sister's death. And as I did, I was set free. Amen. You want to be set free? Amen. This is how to be set free. Now, if Corey Ten Boone could forgive somebody who was responsible for her sister's death and dished out such cruel treatment to so many people, if she could forgive him, can we not forgive a spouse for some injustice? Now, um, 
let's go back now to uh, beating marital burnout. Another step in beating mar marital burnout is to develop a spiritually strong marriage. Now Joshua is a good example here. In Joshua 23 he tells the leaders of Israel he's an old man now. He tells the people what God has done for them under his leadership. Then he gives some practical advice on marriage. He warns the people not to intermarry or they will lose God's protection. But then in chapter 24 he begins his most eloquent theme. He tells the people that serving God should be their highest priority. That uh, and then in verse 15 he asks them to choose this day whom they will serve. And then he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now Joshua didn't say, I will serve the Lord. He didn't put the spiritual responsibilities on Mrs. Joshua. No, he spoke for his entire household when he said, we will serve the Lord. Husband and wife need each other emotionally and physically, but spiritually they need each other desperately. Now, here are three secrets for building spiritual strength uh, in a home. First of all, attend church regularly. Uh, several recent studies confirm that couples who attend church together increases their chances for staying married for life. Other research states churchgoers feel better about their marriages than those who don't worship together. They feel liberated from stress and the tyranny to produce. And worshiping together transforms a couple's relationship and helps them grow spiritually while enlarging their capacity to love each other. And when couples have the same beliefs and attend church together, church activities now form the core of their social activities. But when they have a mixed faith marriage, then there is competition over which church uh, activity they're going to attend. And this comes as a great shock to many young people because before marriage, uh, if there's a mixed faith relationship, oh, they agree, per agree perfectly. They're going to be so considerate of the other person's religion. Yada, yada, yada. But in reality, especially after children are born, they have trouble with that. It's very difficult to work out. Studies also show that when a marriage is in trouble, the couple attend church less frequently than those in happy marriages. The church is supposed to help those in trouble, but couples are afraid to let anybody know there's trouble in paradise. People will talk and become judgmental. But worshiping together will automatically draw a couple together. It brings rest, peace, and renewal. All right, Tian, another thing that can help a couple spiritually is to get involved in a service ministry. Uh, one of the best things you might possibly do is take a mission trip together. And uh, the travel and working together in the foreign country, think of what that would do. It would certainly give you something new to talk about. Or uh, make, uh, uh, serve soup in a soup kitchen. Or help with vacation Bible school. Uh, if you become involved in a service ministry together, it'll give you more time to talk and um, something new to talk about. Now, I also suggest that couples begin praying together. Now, I'm not talking about prayer at meal times. I'm not talking about prayer with the children while you're putting them to bed. I'm talking about couple prayer, praying with and for each other. Now, when I talk to people about this, a lot of them are not comfortable with this kind of prayer. They say, well, prayer is something that I talk to God about, but they don't want to talk in front of their mate about anything. Now, when can you do this? Well, maybe as you are uh, getting into bed, maybe uh, over breakfast in the morning. Some of you might even have to do it on your way to work if you commute together. Um, now, what would you pray for? You can pray for every need in your partner's life. Finances, career and business, health, and work pressures, and children, and parenting, and conflicts in the marriage, and daily stresses, and personal crisis. Now, while you are praying, do something else. Uh, touch each other, 
when you are praying. Now just before I left on this trip, and this is not the first time he has done this, Harry does this every time uh, before I leave. He will come to me and put his arms around me and pray for the trip, the seminar, that everything is going to go well, that the couples will be blessed. But, um, and he put his arms around me. See, we have touch going now. And couples need to slow their life down and touch each other more. You can sit and pray, stand and pray, kneel and pray, hold hands when you pray, embrace when you pray. And physical touching will rebond your relationship. And any wife will love this non-sexual touching. And express love for each other. After praying, say I love you out loud. Or express appreciation to your partner in some way. Or give your partner a tender kiss. Now there are certain benefits of praying together. First of all, it improves communication. Prayer can open clogged lines of communication and even repair damaged communication lines. It gives you more minutes of quality communication together. Prayer relieves emotional tension and reduces and solves conflict. Someone has said, a person cannot be genuinely open to God and closed to his mate. And, hold on fellas, this, uh, the benef another benefit of praying together, it promotes a healthy sex life. Now, um, studies confirm this point, that couples who pray together have a healthy, wholesome view of sex. A Newsweek cover story on prayer showed a strong tie between prayer and intimacy. A survey by Greeley, uh, Andrew Greeley showed that Spouses who pray together report greater marital satisfaction than those who don't, and that frequent sex coupled with frequent prayer makes for the most satisfying marriages. Did you hear that, ladies? And I also um, challenge you to begin praying together every day and watch what this will do for your marriage. And the third step in um, in beating marital burnout is to create pleasurable memories to look back on. Now there's an old saying that says the family that prays together stays together. Amen. Not anymore. The family that plays together still may not stay together unless they pray together. See? So after we've been married a few years we give work and children our best energy. Marriage gets anything that's left over, and there usually isn't that much left over. And this is what creates marital burnout. So I believe that married couples need to date their mate. Have some fun uh, doing this. And Sabbath makes a great date day. You can spend quality time together at church as well on Sabbath afternoon. God gave us the Sabbath uh, so we'd have time to pull our lives together. But we shouldn't run like crazy all week and then crash on the weekend so we can't even make it to church or have no time to give to God. God doesn't work that way. I believe that by Friday night the house should be orderly. There, by the time sundown comes, there should be soft music playing. By the way, I have a DVD on this. It's called The Art of Making Sabbath Special. The children should be able to tell that something new is happening in the household. My daughter Carlene uh, followed this practice on Friday. Uh, she would get the house ready and part of that was switching a bedspread. She had a bedspread, a reversible one, with a blue side and a white side. The blue side was up all week, but on Sabbath she would flip it to the white side. So little Jameson, who was two years old, saw mommy switching the bedspread over. He comes in and he said, Sabbath coming, Sabbath coming. He was only two years old, but he could tell that something different was happening in the house. And that's what should happen on Fridays, is that Friday night, have a simple but, um, but delightful, meal together by candlelight and as soon as the children are old enough allow them to light the candles and then you have a story time and some songs and you put the children to bed early. Parents don't want to put their children to bed early anymore because they're busy working they never get to see their children. 
So they let them stay up late. And you know what? On the Sabbath, you're going to pay the price because they're going to be crabby and irritable because they haven't had enough sleep the night before. But if you put them to bed on time, then you will have some couple time. And that is a beautiful thing on Friday night for the two of you to have a little prayer time, a little time to read together, study together. And um, uh, Sabbath afternoon is another great time for uh, couples to spend time together, go to the park for an outdoor picnic, uh, go to a lake or a waterfall, take your Bibles and read God's Word. And when you celebrate the Sabbath in this manner, it will become the high point of the week. Did you know for Jews, Jews look forward to the Sabbath uh, starting on uh, Sunday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. They are looking forward to the Sabbath. And, and, and then Sabbath is the high point. I'm sorry, my, my week's a little messed up here. And then Thursday, after the Sabbath then, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, they are looking back at the Sabbath and Sunday they start looking forward to the Sabbath. Everything revolves around Sabbath keeping in the Jewish household and I believe we could use a little of that in our homes as well. And um, this is uh, what I believe is uh, a way of holding your family together all these beautiful Sabbaths that you have celebrated together. What a connection that will make between the two of you. So this is how to beat marital burnout. This is how to revive those tired marriages. Uh, number one, seek forgiveness when your mate, with your mate when necessary. Two, develop a spiritually strong marriage. And three, create pleasurable memories to look back on. And a marriage between Christians should be happier because they have different goals and objectives in their lives. You aren't staying married because the church frowns on divorce. You aren't staying married because of the children. Uh, you are staying married because what you are trying to do is create a relationship that shows that God is working in your life. When you do this, your marriage becomes a living testimony of how God's love functions in marriage. It's been said that every couple has a direct influence over 12 other couples. With this ratio of 1 to 12, we could change the world. Tom Dooley, pioneer missionary to Laos, said, Light a candle in a very dark place and it will shine a long, long way. Ellen White says, one well-ordered, well-disciplined family speaks more on behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. And that is my prayer for each one of you, that you can have that well-ordered marriage, that well-disciplined marriage, and that is going to speak more on behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Um, our seminar starts at 4 o'clock. This afternoon, if there's anybody here that would still like to join us, please feel free to do that. We would love to have you come. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we invite your presence to go with us now as we leave this place. Lord, we can't function in our day-to-day -day life without you. And I'm asking for a special blessing on each person here today, that your Holy Spirit will fall upon them, that they will feel your presence, that they will know that they have met Jesus today in this place. Lord, may they take this with them as they leave. I pray for a special blessing on our seminar this afternoon, Lord, that your spirit will also fall upon each person present. We love you, Lord. We want to serve you. We want to see you again in the clouds of glory. Lord, bless us in your precious name. Amen.